Uh, first, we have William C. Anderson, uh, who you met yesterday. He's a writer and activist from Birmingham, Alabama. His work has appeared in The Guardian, MTV, Truth Out, British Journal of Photography, and Pitchfork, among others. Uh, he's the author of The Nation on No Map, Black Anarchism and Abolition, and co-author of As Black as Resistance, Finding the Conditions for Liberation. He's also the co-founder of Offshoot Journal and provides creative direction as a producer of the Black Autonomy podcast. His writings have been included in the anthologies, Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? And No Cells to Defend. And William is joined by Ashanti Alston, uh, who's an anarchist uh, Panther elder. He's a former member of the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army soldier. He's a former political prisoner and longtime member of the Jericho movement uh, and a Black anarchist who developed abolitionist politics in the early days of critical resistance. He has helped save the life of a baby pig with the animal liberationists, learned queer politics for being challenged, and developed non-ego eldership through loving the young in generations who truly want to carry it on. He's pre presently a board member of the National Jericho Movement and Center for Grassroots Organizing in, in Vermont, and he lives in Rhode Island with his family. Let's uh, give them a big welcome. It's a poem written by one of my other comrades who, who passed, man, I think right now, about 20 years ago in prison. His name was Albert Noah Washington, Black Liberation Army. Um, and he wrote this poem called We Dare. Give not thyself over to despair because of those who have fallen and been in prison. For were we not a people spat upon defiled by those who thought themselves superior? And did we not dare to fight back? Remember singing revolutionary songs, eating communal meals, playing with chess, dancing amongst ourselves and with the people as we learn to love one another and struggle together? From our history as a people and our love for the people, courage grew. They sent SWAT, Major K Squad, and FBI to overkill us in body and spirit. Hey, but did we care? Yes, and that's why we dared. And I, I want that to um, go to you and to Matulu to let Matulu know that we here, dare, and we still dare, and we're going to carry this on. I don't know how we're going to start. Can I rely on you? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and, 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 and conversation. It's so not like you, you questioning me. We're going to have conversation. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, right on. Absolutely. Um, I guess I could also, I want to also acknowledge and say rest in power um, to Matulu as well. And I appreciate you starting that way. And I wanted to just kind of open it up by saying uh, for this conversation about Black anarchist futures, what I appreciate about Black anarchism and um, your legacy as it relates to all of this for the future is that when I look at your history, when I look at the history of um, the generation that you come from, and all of the elders who contributed to this strain of thought and to this, to this um, legacy, the thing that I, I feel like I most appreciate about Black anarchism is that it represents, for me, uh, it represents a breakaway and it represents a, um, a fracture uh, from rigid forms of thinking and from the doctrinaire. And it's an example, um, just as much as it is, 
a form of it's a it's a form of praxis that I think illustrates for a lot of younger people like uh, myself and people even younger than I am how we can observe the movements and the conditions and the struggle around us and ask critical questions about the directions that we're headed in and i think that the turn towards anarchism that comes from uh this your generation of people who were involved in the civil rights movement and the black power movement and these organizations that are very romanticized now i think that looking at those things critically as they were happening and asking questions to get to the point of thinking about anarchism was something that was very bold. It was something that was very brave. It was something that was uh, actually leading people to have an example of how they can how they can restructure and rethink about organizing and struggle. And I think that that's what's something that's absolutely crucial when you're thinking about the future. Mm. And I appreciate it. Um, not just as some ideology that I, I I feel needs to be turned into new dogma, but as an example for thinking about the future and looking critically at what's happening around us rather than just sitting around thinking that we're right about everything and we've got everything already figured out. Right, right. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting um, how I came to anarchism. Cause it, it it was not like I immediately embraced it. I was I clearly was like Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, like Black Panther Party, all the literature and stuff like that. And because I found it to be real useful, real powerful, you know. Um, the first time, uh, you know, Panther Party, you had to read, you know, Karl Marx stuff. So here's this class analysis, and I am what's the class analysis? You know, I mean, you didn't really get that in the, in the black power movement and stuff. You know, you read Stokely Carmichael's Black Power book and a few other things. But when I started to grasp this class analysis, this was some powerful shit. You know, this is the so you do America, right? You do the United States and you see it's this capitalist system ruling class, the bourgeoisie. Never heard that term before. In the Panther Party, you call them the bushies, you know, but. It was powerful because it was giving someone like me, this teenager, uh, an understanding of what we were fighting against. There was no longer, you know, the white man, you know, uh, white capitalism, you know, all like that. You get it, you're getting clear on it. At the same time, you're doing this community work and you're able to talk to people in the community. Um, but then they you also had to read. W.B. Du Bois and other cats, the more I'm reading, the more it's like, oh, it's getting clearer and clearer. You're, what you're up against, the enemy and all this other stuff. Uh, but kind of to fast forward, I think when in prison is when I was really uh, in a position to read it and like really think about it. But I remember even in, when I was working out of the Harlem office in the Panther Party, one of my comrades gave me this mimeograph thing on Mokno in the in the revolution, the anarchist revolution in the Ukraine. But I debated him. I debated him from a strong Marxist, Leninist, Maoist position. It was when I was in prison, I like, boy, Frankie, I wish I could have talked to you some more because I think this is what you were telling me. He was critical not only of the Panther Party leadership, but he he was really hard on the Communist Party, too, that this vision that they had of creating a communist society, workers, you know, uh, workers in control, there was some things about it that seemed like it still was like a hierarchy involved. And he, so Frankie was like, well, why are we doing that? And he was also like, why are we following the white Communist Party, but in prison, information from Canada, pamphlets and stuff. My first thing was too idealistic, but I mean, like Spanish Civil War. Then I get more information on the Ukraine and uh, Italy with uh, um, Malatesta, you know, 
and I can study it now. Uh, um, Sunni Alakoli would always say, turn that prison into a university. So now it's beginning to make sense. And it makes me reflect immediately on what happened in the Black Panther Party. Leadership. We on the East Coast, and when it was more than the East Coast thing, we're really suffering at certain points because we're holding the programs together, everything, but the relationship with the leadership in Oakland, California was not great. We sold the newspapers and raise other monies, it goes to Oakland. Certain percentages are supposed to come back to the chapters. I'm in New Jersey. Newark, Jersey City, chapters in New York was suffering because they wasn't getting any monies. And every time they question, you know, they're getting disciplined or expelled. I'm thinking about all this in prison. So I'm feeling like I'm experiencing this and remembering this at the same time that this new literature is saying there's other ways that could have happened. There's more, there was more collective ways to, to develop a leadership. There were more ways to guard against hierarchy. Like, well, then I want to know more, you know, and, and it was and it was shaping me. But my comrades. Most of them was like, Shanti, that stuff is too idealistic. But they wasn't even reading it. It was just what the Marxists had always said about the anarchists. It's just some idealism, you know? But I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> when your comrades are not re really feeling it, feeling it, you really need some courage. Yeah. If, you, if you're feeling you need some courage, if that's where you are, you got to be willing to stand with that, even if you're still kind of uncertain. Am, am I still on this? Am I good? I, uh, I'm, I, if I'm talking too much, you might have to. We're just, we just flowing. But I, I just want to give you a feel like, oh, my God, this is a new opening for me. So you follow it. I followed it. From Lewisburg, certain things happened. Somebody set the industries on fire. I don't know how it happened. Yeah. But I was one of the ones sent to Marion. In Marion, I meet some more folks and they're anarchists. Um, and we have debates now with our Marxist Leninist comrades, with our Muslim comrades. But in the debates, it just helps you to like, I always feel like. If you're reading something new and you think you understand it and you can explain it, it's a good test for me. I, okay, I think I got it. You know, I was clear that we could create different ways of relating to each other and having revolutionary formations. I was clear. You know, Muslims had their, their, their ways, their structures, Nation of Islam folks also. And, um, when it got to things like cadre with those with the Marxist Leninists, I just could not buy into something that you, your top theoretician was the ones who was calling the shots. Like you ain't really got a brain. So my anarchist reasons was telling reasons was telling me that I got a brain, you know, and I want to participate with my brain, you know, and so I couldn't wait to like, well, one day maybe I'll be on the street. Yeah. So, so to keep it short, because there's, there's so many other things, the prison experience, is all, it also helped me to begin to relate to other prisoners differently. I felt like I was no longer the, the Black Panther Party member who was the one educating everybody else. The anarchism was telling me you got to develop a relationship, you know, with others. So I found myself not only having, um, political conversations, but personal conversations, you know, family, you know, your partner uh, and all this other stuff. And I found other issues that we were dealing with now, sexism, because I, I mean, we knew about sexism and we tried to deal with it, but the anarchist material was really stronger. It was stronger on that. 
And it gave me a way to talk to a, a lot of other regular prisoners about even sexism related to this struggle. But I think they appreciated that they had no one to talk to about their relationships outside of the, the people they left behind. I really appreciated that because I'm a people person, right? So from there, Connecticut, no, Lompoc, California, Connecticut, and then at some point getting released. But but I'll stop there because there's there's more. So the thing I want you to understand about it that I love that I have developed the capacity to be open to new learnings that helps me to see what I have been through differently and where I might can go from there. I'm like, yeah, the reading, I'm a reader. I've been a reader. My wife will tell you that when, when our first child was being born, she's in labor. I'm in the corner somewhere reading. <laughs> and she was pissed. <laughs> but I'm a reader. I'm on the subway. I'm reading. The day that the towers came down, <laughs> right? We going into to work in Brooklyn. I got a book in my hand, even though that did catch my attention. I'm a reader. I love it. I love it to this day. If it opens me up, if it gets me to see things I may not have uh, realized before, them blind spots, I think that's the way to go. And I and I credit anarchism for that. And I, if I talk about anarchism, that becomes more important than whether you read Malatesta or anything. Are you open? Are you doing things that help you to see your blind spots? Are you dealing with your heart? Are you, is that involved? So any reading on that, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. And what you were, and what you were saying, uh, made me think about, you know, other people who, uh, would represent the, the legacy here. And, um, as well as a lot of relevant thought, I was thinking when you were talking about your, your experience with the party and looking at things with leadership. So I was thinking about the essay by Kwesi Balagoon, Anarchy Can't Fight Alone, and how he says in that essay, he I'm just loosely quoting here, but he asked this question with these contradictions people were seeing. He, was, he just asked, asked himself, like, why, why was it that people would allow this sort of exploitation and corruption to happen? And he said that it was a realization that the very ideals and the uh, democracy that people were um, supposed to be fighting for, that they wouldn't take a hold of it for themselves. And I was also thinking when you were talking about um, how Lucy Parsons said that a long period of education needs to precede any, any sort of uh, real um, revolutionary action, that you have to have a long period of edu education as a principle of, of anarchism. Because obviously we, when we have these discussions and when we talk about this as black people, um, there's always this weight, this weight of the, the mischaracterization of anarchism. And so much of that has to do with that rigidity and with that doctrinaire thinking um that comes out of uh these conflicts that happened in the socialist movement so so long ago and that went on throughout the eras of um many different generations and it's it's upsetting for me personally uh when i think about my generation and when i think about the future because it's as you said it's a, a lot of times i'm i'm speaking with people and i've obviously read quite a bit about anarchism at this point. I feel um, uh, confident that um, I can have a good discussion with uh, people who are open-minded. And a lot of times I'm talking with folks and I'm just like, you're not reading even the Wikipedia page. Like you didn't even read the Wikipedia page about this. And you're, and you know, you you have these, these, these mischaracterizations and these, lines that you've heard somebody else say this rhetoric to reject what i'm saying or to to dismiss it and i'm and i can say this because i used to do it as well just as you were saying you used to do it there was a time where i was doing it as well i was very dismissive i was like oh that's utopian it's chaos it's terror it's 
it's just open insurrection. It's um, it's not or it's disorganization. It's anti organization. And um, you know, obviously, I met Lorenzo and Janina, and I was like, oh wait, I've I've kind of realized I've just been saying some things I've heard other people saying, and I might actually need to read about this. And when I started reading and doing the deeper study, I was actually a little embarrassed because I was like, oh, I've been walking around saying a bunch of stuff that is completely not true and not, and misinformed. And I've actually uh, not been educated about this. I didn't even understand that anarchism was coming out of the socialist movement. I didn't understand it as stateless socialism. I didn't understand what libertarianism meant before it was you know, hijacked by the Libertarian Party and the right wing. I didn't understand that history. I didn't have a lot of the context. And it was something that became important to me to try to talk to others about because the experiences that I had in terms of organizing, in terms of being in movement coming along with my generation was very similar in um, many ways where I was in organizations. I was doing this organizing work. I was working with people who were brilliant organizers, brilliant strategists, and uh, brilliant radicals, and people who I think I I feel like if we had been better together, that we could have really changed this country together in in bigger ways. And a lot of that time I spent in uh, those organizations and in that and the struggle with uh, different people and the labor movement and the immigrant rights movement and uh, different uh, black movements, I just saw so many things fall apart because of what you're talking about with charismatic leadership, with coercive hierarchies, with um, really uh, destructive relations that people had. And for so many people, um, my age and younger specifically, I think that the reason that this is reproduced so often is because we have such a romantic relationship to the history and to the past. And we sit around and we read and we study. And I look at a lot of people my age and I, I hear what they're saying. And I'm, I'm like, we can't just cosplay the past and just repeat this rhetoric. We cannot just sit up here saying something because X person said it. And this person said it. Oftentimes, when you look at that history, especially if you're looking at something, say, like uh, that's critical of anarchism, for example, you have to look at that in the context of history, why people were saying these things. Maybe it, if you know, if you're talking about the socialist movement, it could have been something completely personal. Could have been this person just didn't like somebody that was an anarchist. So they started saying, I'm going to compete with them and I'm going to write about how much I hate anarchism because I don't like that guy. Or if you're looking at different things from the generations that precede, though, you know, you might just say, oh, I'm going to repeat this rhetoric and say that this is the way things have to be and follow this doctrinaire line. And those were things that were written at different times for different conditions. And for me, Black anarchism represents a call to be able to be brave enough to have a new idea and a new thought and be able to say, I'm going to look at the conditions and the struggle around me and be able to actually think about what I need in this moment, what the people around me need in this moment, what the communities need, and be able to push forward and not be looking at revolutionary thinking that proceeds like it's a Bible that's going to guide us at every direction. Because the people who were writing before us could not necessarily predict everything that was going to happen today. And if you're sitting there looking at the theory and at the organizing and at the revolutions that preceded it as if they are uh, ecclesiastical texts that you can just refer to endlessly, that it's immortal or that it's science that you can always look to and it's going to produce the same result, then you're putting yourself at a disadvantage when new things arise that could not have been predicted or that we're dealing with today, that you're going to be at a disadvantage because you're going to be looking at somebody who probably or maybe could not even conceive of what you're dealing with right now. And so for me, Black anarchism means I'm going to be able to look around at things for myself and to be able to use the past as a guide to understand what worked before to be able to inform what needs to work now. Man, I appreciate that. Oops. <laughs>
you're you're in this movement, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, listen, yes, just real quick. Yesterday, I think I had like three highs. Um, oh, I, about three highs. It uh, whether it was a breakout group or one of the presentations, or, or and sometimes just conversation. But it, it I, the high was because I, I have my ups and downs. I got my depressions, right? But man, when I'm a, I'm in your energy, and I'm hearing y'all talk, I got to keep reminding myself that people are carrying this struggle on, and young folks is carrying this struggle on. And I really do believe that y'all are sharper than our generation. I really do believe that. So I got to stop. Know if I do. You're sharp. You're sharp. Listen, all that talk about intersectionalities and all that other stuff, mm-mm, y'all sharp. Y'all sharp. And the things that you're doing is creative. The the presentations that we've had here, really great. Uh, Malik, what's Malik's name? Last name? McKe- oh, my God. You know, people are doing all kinds of different things and don't even mean that we all uh, in sync on in other things or other ways of thinking. But how they're strangling Detroit, yet look at how life keeps springing up in different organized ways. You know, people are not giving up, you know. So I'm listening to you talk. I'm like, and I knew that I, we would be on this panel together. Y'all are sharp. So it's like, how do we get it? How do we do it then? How do we communicate with each other? How do we deal with the frustrations? That's more important to me than I think anything, because I don't think we deal a lot of times with how does it make us feel when we we have these great ideas, we got these sharp analysis, but it don't seem like the the people we want to reach are as excited about it as we are, if excited at all. How does it make you feel, you know? So sometimes it it makes me feel like, man, we're not going to pull this together. It makes me feel that way also because I know how the security culture and the security technologies are increasing. And I kind of see it as how it corrals us. And then the rate of the destruction of the planet, right? What are we going to do? Are we going to sit around and keep thinking that it's going to be voting somebody in or are we going to get a what? We need another black Supreme Court judge or, or do we need another Obama? They get us to buy into these things. And I'm like, man, we ain't got that much time to feel that kind of pressure. Yet at the same time, you know, you got to take your time and build authentic relationships. Absolutely. So that requires some new thinkings and stuff. And so again, I I never think it's just the the readings help, but we need to find exper- we need to experiment with ways that helps us to deal with us on many different levels, on what we want to do, but also with our relationships. Total, actually total, you know, the all, even the cosmic. You know, we gotta really think of this stuff. We get wounded. We come in with wounds. We was talking about some of this yesterday. So if 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 it's a free society we want, how does that feel in us? We're still the people that have been chewed up in this empire. Just because we joined an organization or we just finished reading the, the latest book, you know, on uh, food sovereignty or whatever, ain't enough. Are we willing to be vulnerable? You know, as as we're asking the people in our communities to be vulnerable, to even listen to us. Can we deal with our own traumas at the same time that we're asking others to? For me, I, I, I and it's not just a black anarchism, but just anarchism in general. How can we begin to factor in those type of uh, thinkings and practices that helps us? to stay in healthy places, healthier places, while we're asking people in the community to do the same things, hopefully through what we're proposing in the organizing formations we're asking them to be a part of. 
So it makes me read a lot of different things today. But I'm always, if I'm on the internet and Googling, I always put like, if I want to know more about spirituality, I put anarchist spirituality. <laughs> I don't want to see what I get. Right. Um, and there's a lot of stuff because I'm assuming that the anarchist spirituality is not going to be like the church experiences that we may know or the whatever the, the other experiences are. You know, people might be surprised. Know that my 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 family church is the church I was born in, but it, it's a it's a church that would be considered Hebrew Israelite, not to be identified with the buckle wearing people, right? And that you might see on television, but follows the prophetic Judaism. We, my family left the church 50 years or so ago and, and went to the Baptist, but I done found myself back into the church that uh, I was born into. But even with that, if I'm, if I'm reading about Judaism, I got to put in anarchist Judaism because I want to find readings in the, in the folks and organizations that are looking for more liberatory ways of being about that. And I find it. Same thing with Christianity, which le which led me to liber uh, liberation theology. I, you, if you're talking about Jesus, show me an anarchist Jesus. You know what I'm saying? But in doing that, it also allows me to have better ways of communicating, having conversations with people who may be Christians, who may be who may follow Judaism or or, or even uh, Islam. I was even surprised when I put in anarchist Islam. It's a new book out too. Yeah, and and there's a there's a brother from Canada who actually know. I think one of the books might be his. So it's all these things that these ways that I look for that helps me to see that there's folks doing things all over the place, from the academic writing to the on the ground practices. But we got to look. And at the same time, keep us in mind as individuals on how we relate to our, us as a, you as an individual and those who you are in relationships with. So, you know, all the stuff, sexism, uh, you know, the patriarchies and all that stuff. But how about, who else is depressed? Who else uh, uh, go, uh, doesn't know how to go through grief? We were talking about some of that yesterday. So for anarchist futures, the reason why I like I, I really want to talk about futures is what's the other intersections that we need to consider? And this project that we're involved with, we're wanting to change the world. You know, I mean, it, it's not simple, but it does require us to be willing to look and then to be willing to get vulnerable about what the new understandings might say about you as an individual. I, I, I shared another example. I was sharing, man, y'all had me on fire yesterday. Uh, I had a good friend. I haven't been in touch with her in years. I hope she's still alive. Uh, queer woman, woman of color. And uh, we worked at the same job. And I must have said something that was kind of fucked up in terms of, you know, queer folks. She came to me the next day. She said, Ashanti, here, you read this. The book was Queer Theory. I'm a subway person, take the subway to, to, uh, to work to anywhere I'm going. And I read. I read. You see me, I got a book. But now I got Queer Theory. I ain't holding the book so much like this. I'm holding the book down like this. <laughs> that little act right there told me about a little limitation I got here. And I had to just consciously like, Shanti, bring the fucking book up. <laughs> so in me, I, I want to be that person. I don't want to be stuck. Right. There's too much time being wasted, yeah. yes. and and then if I if I know that someone 
else is inspired by me or look up to me. I want to be not the example of the perfect person, but the person who wants to continue to learn and to challenge themselves. That becomes important to me, you know. So when I um, when I was so excited that that we were finally going to get a chance to meet, um, there's a lot of books being stuff being written. My concern is always about those who are writing the books. Are you active in some ways in the community somewhere? So it's not just all academic, you know. And I think that 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 is still my concern today. Um, just briefly coming out of prison, you looking. I'm looking for folks who are uh, who are anarchists and it's love and rage. Um, I'm gonna say mostly white, but not significant folks of color, and they were at least talking about uh, challenging race, sex, sexism, and all that other stuff. But I got to see how they operate. But I'm I'm like I can't work with them the, the hair styles, you know. I, I, I want to work with them, but I, it's kind of tough getting close to people that got the spikes good hair. Uh, uh, yet, come on, Ashanti, I'm a, I'm a good people person, so I I I, I develop relationships. But when Lorenzo's book comes out, it's a focused approach on the community where I want to do my work. So I have something, you know, and so that's why that that book was so groundbreaking, you know, uh, for many of us. So 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 it's, it's so it's here here we are now, you know, and it's like I feel like I've been out of it for a while, but there's I want to read medieval stuff, and I want to be like him when I'm eighty years old. I want to talk the same way. <laughs> And I'm gonna give y'all problems the same way. <laughs> but but anyway, it just it, it it do it do come back to the reading, the things that open you up, the experiences that lets you know that there's blind spots, and to be willing to try different things. I have not found that anywhere else other than in anarchist circles. I have not, you know. So that's why we got to keep those things going i i don't i'm not for any one even anarchist thing like okay this is no we got to experiment what what you what you said maybe think about when you know when we first uh kind of walked into each other we're into each other here uh one of the points you uh, brought up was about uh my my writing about and thinking about zen and I think that is is relevant here because um I I also grew up in the, I grew up in the church and um I oftentimes speak about religiosity and there are a lot of my um criticisms of things I see happening on the left are rooted in things that I grew up seeing in the church and uh so much of uh leftism and of uh ideology the relationships that people have with ideology uh, is very um, religious. It's very um, it's very um, rooted in like a sort of like zealotry. A lot of the time, I feel like people get with their with their relationships with their ideology. And so, growing up and seeing that in the church, um, very intimately, I began to look for other faith practices and look to other religious and spiritual practices. And initially, um, I uh, started looking into Tibetan Buddhism and I started going to a Tibetan temple and speaking with a monk there. Um, and I noticed that there was, in so many of the places I was going, running sort of there was uh always replications and repetition of the same things i was running from mm -hmm. and i saw that when i when i uh started studying tibetan buddhism i started seeing the the same sort of uh sort of unquestioned faith and ultimately 
I was um, becoming more interested uh, because of the late Thich Nhat Hanh and Zen. And when I started reading about Zen Buddhism, it actually paralleled the trajectory I was on with going closer towards anarchism. And ultimately it took some time, but I got to a place where I was like, oh my gosh, these things are so parallel in so many ways. Because when you look at these ancient Zen monks at the foundations of Zen Buddhism, they were saying these very confrontational things about Buddhist doctrine and saying, you know, you have these, these, these monks who are saying, you can't just sit here meditating, staring at a wall and have a bald head and think that that means you're going to reach enlightenment just because you're repeating this, this, uh, doctrine. You have to actually understand your own nature. You have to actually have a relationship with yourself and the world around you. And for me, that aligned so perfectly with the trajectory I was on with thinking about anarchism, because again, it was about being able to observe conditions without being so doctrinaire that you think that it's already written. And if you just follow this program, you're going to reach enlightenment and enlightenment can be a parallel for the way we talk about liberation. So with that being the case, um, it, the, the iconoclasm of Zen, uh, Buddhism has been something that has been very inspiring for me in terms of study and in terms of thinking. It's led me to a lot of places to be able to better understand a lot of those replications and repetitions, a lot of those things that, um, I'm speaking about because Ultimately, you know, what you, the point you were mentioning about um, people being active, I think it was kind of like in reverse for me because, I, you know, I came from a, a pretty political household as well. So I was introduced to a lot of um, the, the history of ra radicalism and a revolution by my folks, by my family history. And for that to have been the case, I, I feel like I was primed to kind of get into activism and organizing the way I did. But it was, I was a teenager when I started getting involved in organizing and um, got into the movement. And I had to do that to be able to write now. Mm -hmm. So I didn't write first and then say, oh, I need to do something. <laughs> you know, it was that. I was doing so much and I was active so much that I said, I need to sit down and read and write. Right. And my relationship with writing and with reading comes out of the experiences that I had in the movement where I said, this isn't working. This we're just repeating these, these shortcomings and these pitfalls over and over. I need to go and study and sit down and read and write my thoughts out so that hopefully maybe I can figure something out or we can figure something out together more so and having con these conversations so we don't keep falling into these same traps. And so that's my relationship. Um, it was, it was really that the being active and being involved in struggle was what made me get to a place where I wanted to, to write and, uh, where I was doing some deeper study. And so when I think about the anarchist piece there, anarchism is not, um, anarchism is not the, the, it's not, it's not liberation. And I always talk about anarchism being a tool. And the reason I do that is because of what I just said, seeing the replication and seeing the repetition. And sometimes when I'm talking to people, it's like, they're they're very excited about anarchism in a way that I'm that I uh, can be wary of oftentimes because it's like I just don't want to see anarchism become new dogma, and I don't want it to become new religion. Don't come from over there where you were doing that with whatever, and then come to anarchism and do it do it with that. You know, because initially that was something that I felt like I was going to start doing if I didn't catch myself. Yeah. Because I started asking myself, am I fighting for liberation or am I fighting for anarchism? Mm -hmm. 
And what I mean by that is there's a difference between actually trying to achieve a, a, a different condition that is actually liberatory for people and fighting to preserve an ideology. And when you're fighting for an ideology instead of fighting for better conditions and, and fighting for a better world for people, those are two different things. And I just have realized that there are a lot of people, especially in, in uh, my generation, and I'm like, you're not, you're not fighting for a better world. You're fighting for your ideology. And that is, that is something that we have to actually, I think, push against so hard when we're thinking about the future. These, these tools, these writings, these um, theories are things that we are trying to build something better with. And we have to be multifaceted and be thoughtful about our approach. And if we get too caught up in thinking that we have this perfect analysis already, we're always going to fall behind as conditions change and as the world change, because the people who are in power that we're fighting against can easily manipulate folks who think that they've already got it figured out. Because you know what? They're predictable. So I think that you have to be innovative and you have to be creative because if you're just sitting up here doing the same, it's like a, it's like, and you know, if you're talking about football, if you run in the same play every single, every single time, the other team is always going to beat you because you keep running the same play. So many radicals from my generation and for the future, we got to stop running the same play. We have to be innovative and we have to be creative and we have to fight for liberation, we have to fight for better for a better world that is very different from fighting to preserve your ideology and the sanctity of whatever tradition you follow. We need to start breaking a lot of traditions and we need to start being innovative and creative. When you, when you, uh, you when you were talking about uh... Zen Zen Buddhism. I was I wanted to ask you um, when you are frustrated when you begin to see all these things. What do you do when you're frustrated? You know when you you see people making the same mistakes, running the same plays. What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> um sometimes i i get very upset and i will get on the phone with my friends and rant and i love my friends i love my family my community because i have people who are willing to listen to me talk about the same things that i'm frustrated with <laughs> a lot of the time and i lo I, I love my people cuz um you know, it, it, it means that you have good people when they, they know you're going to come to them and vent and they're willing to be supportive and not get too annoyed. Um, but it's mutual. I do it for them as well. And, um, you know, I oftentimes, uh, go somewhere and spend some time in nature. I spent a lot of time in the forest. I spent a lot of time, with, you know, lakes and creeks and water. Um, I listen to music. I'm in, I'm in love with black music. Mm -hmm. I have always been in love with black music. I listen to jazz. I listen to, you know, I listen to trap music. I listen mm -hmm. to everything. Um, I just love music, really. But I recognize, obviously, the impact of black culture globally in terms of music. and. Um, I do these different things to to try to release, but at the end of the day, I oftentimes I'm always going to go pick up that pen and paper, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go or I'm going to go sit at my computer. And I'm going to start writing, mm -hmm. and when I go out and I get involved and I find my place in struggle or whatever frustrations I might encounter, I'm going to say, "Hey, I, I got to go write about this because those people I'm ranting to on the phone, right." Well, that's what I'm saying to him. I keep seeing people say da, 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 da. that's not true. I got to write this mm -hmm. so that somebody else can see what I'm talking about here. And this was this was a big part of um, 
you know, the writing of this uh, most recent book was I wanted to write a text that people could read easily and see I'm I'm trying to be helpful. I'm trying to come in the spirit of love and say a lot of this is not working and we have to break away from it because it's getting really bad out here. And if we don't switch up the plays now, we're going to be in even worse conditions. We have to try new things. And so a lot of times it means writing and trying to create um, an intervention, trying to be somebody who can push for an intervention. Because I think that um, I think that the ability to illustrate that for people is extremely important. And so I don't think that um, it's just me or anything. I'm just trying to be a part of the collective that is doing this work mm -hmm. and see my place and struggle to be able to contribute to folks who are pushing for that intervention, to push for that shift away from the the repetitions that we see. Right. I um I think the last maybe five years I I, I talk about depression more. Um, but I, I, I share with people too, like when I'm in a certain space, how I kind of deal with the depression is I'll pull out my photos and start reminiscing, you know, and I got all these photos uh from not none from panther days because we was they the way they had us was like no tattoos if you ain't got to take no pictures don't take no pictures you don't want nothing on you that can identify you because you might potentially be in the underground so i, I ain't that's i ain't got no tattoos today but um or any photos of us and doing panther activities you know but um after so after that there's photos of things I've been in, uh, reunions. And it's so great for me to like reminisce because it's all these great moments. So uh, it's me just, I need a, I need some time to just go through great moments. I, and I'm sure it just helps me to remember that there can be more great moments. You know, it ain't over. Uh, other, the, uh, one of the other things is, is, um, Sometimes I'll try to find the right red wine, dry red wine. You know, that helps. Especially especially because my doctor says as a diabetic, dry red wine is good for you. You know, that's why I say medicinal. You know, y'all thought I was using that for other reasons. <laughs> you know, but that and there's times when I am with my old comrades and we get to talking. And it's just so great because we talk about things that happen, things that we may have done that was like crazy, but now 50 years later, we can laugh about them. And, and the way we talk about it, you know, it's like, it's like an inner circle thing. No one re else is really gonna understand why we laughing. But it seems like we all, me and my comrades need these moments where we know that we understand that period you know and it becomes really therapeutic i think it's it's great for us to uh think about um not not only the photos and, and stuff but folks who is important in your life that it's really good to stay in touch i think a part of my even depression is that i i isolate i ain't even picking up the phone to call folks you know and i need to do it connect 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 reconnect you know renew connections make new ones because man you when you start feeling isolated you start feeling like mm, we ain't gonna do this you know but you might be feeding your own sadness misery and be willing to look at it you know i would love to smoke some marijuana but i'm scared <laughs> Don't be scared. Don't, oh, really? <laughs> but that's, I think that because of what we're up against, we know the viciousness, the evilness of this empire. We have got to have ways of holding it together, of nourishing the spirit, of being playful. And, and even I, or this reading I did in prison too, I became a, a big reader of Wilhelm Reich. 
So function of the orgasm, um, um, the one on uh, fascism, what was the title of that one? Uh, but but a big part of Wilhelm Reich's uh, thinking was that as human beings, the life that flows through us is very sexual and that we need not run from it, but we need to also recognize the the system that you live in also can corral that vibrant energy within you and put it into patriarchal forms, you know. So his thing was, y'all should learn to enjoy your, yourselves. It's, 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 it's no different from what Marcuse or Audre Lorde talking about the function of the, uh, not, the erotic, you know. That's why, you know, like, that was so exciting for me because it's like, yeah, we need to be alive. We need to be alive, you know. We need to be able to enjoy what we can of this life in the in the forest and stuff. All this stuff I read is like, yeah, man. Some of it is like, go hug a tree, you know. And 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 for some it might sound funny, but you know, even the studies will say, man, get in, get in the woods, go farm, all that stuff. That's why you know the the land projects to me, I think is a very important thing because we need to, in a sense, reconnect with life in ways that this society, industrialization, the technolization of, of life has divorced us from just being in touch from the earth to the, what, the far as we can see. So it's helpful because it helps us to remember who we are as human beings, you know, and to see, you know, what's the blind spots. Let's get away from the blind spots. So that's why I like when I, you find out all the land projects going on in Detroit, like, well, this is good. This is good. And in, and in Rhode Island too, there's people doing land projects. And in, in New York, I know folks who are doing upstate New York. And I, uh, the land project that I'm on the board of, which I do hardly anything, my dream is to use it not only for food sovereignty, but just for people in the movement to get out of the city every now and then and just stick that hand in the dirt, go through the woods, look up at the sky. And it was also a part of that vision too, is for folks coming out of prison especially if I've been in there for a few decades, instead of going right to some city, come to these land projects so that you can kind of really get, some, get a little freedom, get a little taste of freedom on that level so that your body somewhere can remember, you know, what was it before states, class, society? Because that I think that's still in us too, right? We got to figure it out. And it means we got to be creative, you know. So being here, I'm hoping that the energy that y'all done poured into me that got me so all over the place, I want to go back home with that and make sure that I'm making efforts, even small ones, reconnect. You took that person's phone number, give them a call, you know, or email. Or the people right in the in the local area I've been talking about uh, reaching out to do it because it keeps me alive. It allows me not to sink back into that space of inactivity, and I'm and, and me admitting that. And you know I've done been in this depression so long. I I gotta admit it gotta be something about it that I enjoy because I ain't making a great effort to get out of it, and I want to get out of it. And if it's me, who else? Everybody I have been talking to, um, not so somewhat here. If I say depression, it'd be like, oh yeah, man, I'd be depressed too. I've been depressed too. Sad, been sad. Don't know how to deal with grief, you know. So, and I, and I know I've said it several times, but I, I feel like it is that important. Yeah, it's that important. If we can, if we can talk about it and look at it, we can see how we have our own self limitations, which is our participation 
in our own oppression as well. Yeah. My takeaways there were wine, weed, and sex. <laughs> I'm just playing. Okay. I'm just playing. I um I I really appreciate uh what you what you were saying because um well for one uh it it can, it can become very isolating and if you ever need to talk I just want to say up here in front of everybody you can always talk to me you can always call me and reach out and I would Thank love you. to fellowship with you and um I'm very glad to be talking to you for the first time uh in in front of people today and um I I uh, think that you're you're very right that uh it is important to to be able to find uh pleasure and and uh happiness and to be able to find some sort of refuge and uh oftentimes in these spaces uh it can feel very um hard uh I think that a lot of times people are very punitive with themselves and very um hard on ourselves thinking that we have got to carry the weight of the world because we're the you know we might imagine ourselves as some sort of vanguard that has to be doing everything and in here i gotta go here and do this i gotta do that or it's not gonna and so i think much of so much of that thinking i feel like is very uh totalizing in a way that um uh ends up doing a lot of damage to people a lot of a lot of uh folks who i've encountered uh my generation i'm like we need to get some help and i i can't imagine um you know going back to times where say even therapy wasn't even talked about it you know but like with with these spaces so many times people come into these left spaces looking for a release from a lot of traumas they've experienced and looking for somewhere to put energy towards something to get their mind off of or to try to get away from a lot of pain. And I think that that's what leads to some of the fervor that you see around these these things that we talk about mm -hmm. is that a lot of people are oftentimes running. Um, and I know that for myself that I've had that experience of looking to these spaces as a, Lord, as a sort of getaway. But I think a lot of times we have to actually be a lot more forgiving and compassionate to ourselves to be able to function our best in these spaces, starting with some internal work that um, isn't so, isn't us being so hard on ourselves in a way that um, can actually damage the things that we're trying to accomplish together. Because what breaks down a lot of the organizing and a lot of the struggle that i've seen is a lot of people not dealing with traumas that they have and people having these really terrible experiences because you have a big ball of trauma a bunch of people with a lot of different weight that they're carrying a lot of different pain that they're carrying and they're coming together not dealing with it and projecting it onto each other and just things just melt down so quickly that way and I think that we're in such an um, important point in time where we can have more open conversations about that. But it also is just important to actually be able to try to move beyond it and not let it um, destroy destroy the things that we would hope to achieve together. And I think a big part of that is what you were saying, being able to get in touch with um, are what the things that make us happy and the things that um provide a, a a respite for us and you know whatever whatever that may be um you know as as long as this is something that can be good and generative for us to be able to get to that place i think that that's extremely important that we don't become so uh militaristic and serious all the time about you know everything it's good to you know go just release and have and have a good time and you know let let go for a little bit to be able to do this work this is heavy 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 work and you know i can't i can't imagine for so many of the 
the, the the legacies of black anarchism for so many of your generation being political prisoners being imprisoned and the things that y'all experienced the things you saw i know that i can't even imagine some of the the horrors and um to think about uh isolating and not uh you know really feeling like you have anybody to talk to and being depressed um that's something that uh, we should at least be able to do for each other is to be able to model the world that we want to to be in by being able to connect with each other and also connect with ourselves. So I think that we might need to open up the questions. 30 minutes. If that if that you want to do that. Um, first, thank you, Ashanti. Um, you know, thinking about a lot of the ways that the intergenerational gap between um, Black anarchic radicals need to be bridged more. And it's just an honor to be here and to be able to listen to you in person. Um, my question was more so about, like, the idea um, of, like, dialectical determinism. And I know that was brought up in the first panel. The, not the first. It wasn't the first day. I was here Saturday. Um, for the dialectics discussion. And um, I'm thinking more so about like the, my question has to do about, um, has to do with like the black identity and my relationship to blackness um, was very particular. Like I grew up in Atlanta where, you know, the black Mecca where black capitalism reigns. And when I was politicized, I understood black capitalism as like this this attack on um, the, a deliberate attack on the the black power movement by the Nixon administration. I know Lorenzo was talking more about that during um, his panel. And my question is like, what is with this ongoing attack on on blackness as um, a political identity? What does that mean for black anarchism? Um, and with the rise of like this black neo-colonial class and how like, you know, identity, this this idea that like your identity could revolutionize you can be a point of radicalization has now been like commodified and has turned into like more so a representation politic. Like how do we stop that from spilling into black the black anarchic tradition? Um, and because I, I'm, I'm a, I was an organizer on the ground. I'm not that well read. I'm still, you know, reading Lorenzo. I'm still reading you. I'm still reading a lot more about um, Black anarchism. But um, I do see just that struggle there. And I've been reading more about, um, I've been reading some Kowasi Balagoon and, and, and um, kind of more so want to identify as a new African anarchist. <laughs> Um, outside of like, you know, the nation state, just the the idea of what it means to be new African. But yeah, like what might that language with the rise and like this co-optation of of the black identity and, and the rise of the black neo-colonial class, like what does that mean um, for, you know, because I feel like that's dialectics now. We're in a different, we're a completely different context than we were um, when, when black anarchism, when the first wave of black anarchism in the States rose up. Um, so yeah, like what might that look like to fight against this this co-optation? Do we need new language? Um, yeah, that's my question. Now, I'm I'm not saying I I'm not saying I can answer that, right? I, I give my thought and and I would love help, you know. What are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> but I I mean around the ident identity, do we need new language? Yes. Because the old language a lot of time reflects, for me, where we're stuck. Old, you know, uh, identity around are we black? You know, black folks, uh, folks of African descent. I mean, it was shaped at a time where it was very, very maleist thing, in the, even in the black community. Um, man, we still dealing. For me, we're still dealing with now how them prison walls blot out certain folks in the black community. Like if you go to a certain black nationalist conference, you ain't gonna find no black queer folks there. You know, if you, if you find women there, you ain't necessarily gonna find them in leadership roles. So what are we talking about black? 
And it's internal struggles, no doubt. And I, I think it's internal struggles we need to challenge. And if, and if feelings get hurt, way hey, you've been hurting us long enough, you know. But it, it opens us up. I mean, it gives us a chance to see that our vision of freedom liberation has to get enriched and expanded too, you know, so that we feel that we are a people. You know, we got to learn to accept our own diversity. We ain't no monolithic group, though we we got some things. We ain't fighting for no capitalist society. We're not, you know, the, the black mecca thing and whatnot. But um, I, I, I feel like uh, amongst black anarchists in particular, because a big percentage, I think, of black anarchists are queer. We've seen that, I think, even at the uh, uh, first... APOC conference that uh, uh, and afterwards that a lot of folks who was uh, queer was finding a space to finally feel accepted. And that began to grow. I think we're at a point now because of uh, that the popularity of, of anarchism, I, I feel there's a growing popularity in, in uh, communities of color in general but particularly uh, amongst black folks, that we need to keep building on that. And it, and when we're in them circles with our old family, political family members who are still stuck, that's our internal struggle. That's our internal challenges. And we need not shy away from it. That's, that's why I feel like for me, because I got a little social or cultural capital, I don't know what you would refer to it, because Black Panther, Black Liberation Army, political prisoner. They might listen to me, right? And I think it's it's, it's the same with the Janina and uh, and Lorenzo because of who we are. Folks might listen. I feel it particularly important that I challenge my community and who we exclude in that queer community. I'm on a little shaky ground on this, and 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 I, and I say that because I want help. I, I feel there's something about the uh, the participation of the queer community that encourages our imagination of a new society like never before. There's something in there and I'm still trying to figure it out, but I know I'm on the right, I, at least in me, I feel I'm on the right path. Y'all are going to Take us somewhere that's with under our feet, there's a seismic shift. We got to get used to this. We just got to get used to it. We're going to get shook up, but it should give us a chance to reorganize our whole, our whole being, how we participate in this whole world of worlds, you know, and it's somewhere in there. And that's why I think there's such a popularity with, uh, um, science fiction, fantasy. My wife and them, man, you talk about Octavia Butler. She is like a, a prophetic. She's a prophet, you know? And they read the, the other one, N.K. Jones. I can't read it, but I know this shit is important. <laughs> you know? But the identity has to evolve. And we have to help that to happen. Yeah. I did. I want to say that's the first time I've had an opportunity to say that. I, I, I'm mm. just like, um, I think about it all the time. Like my community, our community, you know, we can be really heterosexist, homophobic, all that shit. Mm. And man, if we don't deal with that, we ain't never going to be free. And so I listen and I read. That's why that book, Queer Theory, was so instrumental to let me know that it challenged me on how I thought about what is a human being that was shaped by patriarchal folks. Like, oh, okay, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to start it by saying uh, thank you both for a number of things, for starting with a poem, for making me cry a bit, talking about depression and grief. I needed that, um, but I wanted to pick up on 
your really helpful conversation about the dangers of becoming doctrinaire or stuck or closed-minded and that sort of thing. Because I'm sure there's a lot of folks in the room who can relate to what y'all were saying about how uh, being introduced to anarchist thought, anarchist writings, anarchist practice uh, helped to shake a lot of us up. But but there's also dangers of becoming doctrinaire in a new way, right? By identifying as an anarchist or becoming too stuck in certain kind of practices, repeating ourselves, like you were saying, William, like running the same play all the time. Um, and at first, I just wanted to share an observation, which is that a lot of the time I feel like when we see folks repeating the same play or getting too stuck in fighting for an ideology, from the outside, that can look like a problem with the way folks are thinking. But also part of your conversation reminded me that it's not always like a weakness in people's thinking or anything. There can be things that are really great about people, like that I really admire so-and-so. I've really learned a lot from, I'm indebted to so-and-so, which raised a lot of questions for me, like what's the difference between romanticizing or idolizing someone and admiring them, right? What's the difference between uh, treating someone as a celebrity or a hero and being mentor and being a mentee, something like that. But I wonder, just to, just to pick up on the football analogy, I sometimes worry that um, that when, especially the young anarchists, get the idea that we need to be running different plays all the time, then that can just become something, another kind of like vice in our movements, where instead of running the same play, now it's like unpredictability for the sake of unpredictability or experimentation for the sake of experimentation. So I was wondering if you, if, you, if you all could share from your experience, what do you think, or what, what for you have been useful tools, but also just ways of being that you've seen in yourselves and in others that allow your team <laughs> to, you know, strike a balance between like experimentation for experimentation's sake and, and not getting stuck. Right. Like, how can you experiment in ways that are actually meaningful and that respond to conditions as they are and an updated, fresh analysis of how things are and what people need now? You know, so that you're not just doing this thing like, oh, we must be doing it right if they can't predict our next move, because then you're defining yourself, the, 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 the value of your work externally by, you know, how the state is prepared or not to prepared to respond to you. Which also means that you're not actually doing things like paying attention to the conditions or needs of people. And anyway, I hope that makes sense. I want to say I really appreciate what you guys are saying and explaining, you know, because in the Native community, we have similar struggles around, you know, people saying, well, what you're saying is not really that important. You know, people just got to get fed. They, they, they want to talk about immediate things that they got to deal with. But we, as a, as anarchists, we do immediately take try to take care of people's need. Like in cooperation in Tulsa, where I was, we started community gardens in a black community because there was a need there, and we filled it. So we're not academics up in the head, up in the clouds. I don't have a degree. All I got is a, I just graduated from high school. But anyway, I wanted to put out a challenge to not just you know black people as you call yourself. But white people, as you call yourself, you know, because those are terms, or even queer people, those are terms that the society, which is homophobic, racist, uh, basically gave those labels to you because originally you were called Negroes, which is also just another Latin word for black. But I'm trying, I'm going to say, don't take labels that they gave you and think you're going to be somehow that it's going to be liberating. It's like native people, they call us redskins. And some people still among the native community call themselves skins. And what it's a common thing about that is that colorism. We're not black, just black. We're not just white. We're not just redskins. You know, and we need to figure out a way to put a positive name to our peoples besides color. And one of the things that we changed right here, I, I wasn't the only one, I don't think, but we start talking about instead of people of color, we talk about people of the global majority, because that's more accurate, it's more positive. It shows the strength that we have, the power that we, that is in our potential. So I'm, I'm challenging you guys to think 
how do we change to get away from describing ourselves white, black, red, yellow, even the Asian people? You know, they don't go around and call themselves yellow. And <laughs> we, we don't have to call ourselves redskins or white white people or or black. You know, people in Africa don't call themselves black. People in the Caribbean, a black woman came from the Caribbean and she said, the first time I heard about black people is when I came to the United States. Because they didn't call themselves that back there. So that's a challenge. And it's I know it's gonna be difficult. And the same with queer, you know, they gave you that label, and you think you can flip it around by calling yourself queer, but it doesn't really work that well. There's a better way, a more positive way to decide what are the positive things of people that are gay, you know, lesbian or whatever. What are those positive aspects that you can give to the rest of the community instead of just queer? So that's my challenge. Because we all, as I said before, we've got to keep thinking new ways. And, we, and if we have a minority of opinion, we have to put them out there and challenge people to think on a different level. And since that that kind of was more of a statement than a question, so maybe I can just like get my question in there too. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so um, uh, I have two. Uh, I'll try to be really quick. Uh, they're really about organizing. Uh, the first is about like movement formations, you know, it seems like, and also I, I want to say everybody here is so inspiring. It is so inspiring to be here. Thank you guys both so much. Uh, and I, I, something I appreciate about both of you is that your thinking comes from organizing and it is applicable to how we are organizing right now. And, you know, I am curious what you think about movement formations for like mass organizing, like outside of our radical bubbles, whether it, you know, I'm curious what you think about spokes councils or on a larger level municipalism, you know, things that regular people can actually come and participate in and not be like, I'm completely alienated by your jargon. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, and then the second one is uh, with young people, like I, I appreciate that you bring up purity politics, um, but I actually don't organize in those bubbles, you know, and and I would love to invite you both to the Tromoplex if you're here this week. It's all black for the first time in 30 years. And, uh, you know, they are surrounded by gentrifying sharks, you know, and and I, you know, I I want to just be like, I don't know, like supportive of what their vision is for that space. And also, you know, they they need support in generative, it, it's an opportunity, it's land, you know, it could be reparations, it could be so many things with support from elders like you, like other people, like Black leaders in this community that ha have a vision. So those are my two questions. Thank you so much. Sorry if I talked too long. Thanks for so with with regard to the very first question, I think um, <clears throat> about uh, just kind of innovation or breaking away or just for breaking away's sake, I think that um, one of the ways to kind of counter that is by actually being with people. And I think that oftentimes it is revealed to us and how we talk about and how we think about movement um, what we actually think of people. And uh, <clears throat> the discussions that we have oftentimes get caught up in, in a sort of vanguardism of thinking that we are going to decide for the masses what the program is going to be, what needs to be done, and people are going to fall in line, rank and file people are going to fall in line and follow behind this vanguard that's going to guide everybody to revolution and to liberation. And I think that not getting caught up in innovating just to, for the sake of saying, I'm just doing something different, uh, means actually being connected enough with community and being in struggle with people as a person amongst a collective enough and sincerely sincerely enough to understand that understanding people's needs around us as a collective seeing all of our different roles in struggle seeing the different places that we have in struggle means that we're we're going to be able to develop to develop sincere understanding because our needs and the conditions around us are going to speak to that 
So I think that when you are sincere and actually not operating in this uh, top down sort of one size fits all radicalism and vanguardism, that you'll avoid that because the sincerity of understanding that you're actually trying to meet people's needs is going to be based on how do we actually meet people's needs rather than sort of some sort of event adventurism or some sort of uh, top down sort of leftism. So I think that that's how I think it just will happen from the sincerity of actually being in struggle and, and listening to the people around you and not thinking that uh, you're the the leader that's guiding all the sheep, you know? Um, I think it's going to get more into the experimental stuff. Um, oh, I think it's more going to be the experimental thing that I would talk on because I... I, I do feel like we got to experiment with a lot of different things, but not for the sake of just experimenting. Um, I, I think the good thing about communications and stuff, whether it's through newspapers or media, is that we get to find out what different people are doing in different places and what seems to work, and what doesn't. Yeah, it, it is one way to find out. And I think conferences is good for that, too, when people can kind of bring what they've been doing so others can see and you and you make some decision about what you want to try. Key for me in all these trying is, is it inclusive? Is it bringing people in? Is it, is it helping people to feel that they're particip participating in the decision making? I think about that period of um, HIV AIDS, you know, me coming out of prison into the midst of all that stuff. But working at, uh, at the time I was working at, um, the, um, they deal with birth control. They deal with Planned Parenthood. I work for Planned Parenthood. So we have got trained uh, in, you know, HIV AIDS awareness and all this other stuff. At the same time, I would look, I'd be looking up, well, what, what are all these, what are people doing to help deal with this crisis in the community? And some, you know, got major support of it from some kind of institution Others that was outside of institutions may not have gotten any support, but may have offered some really good practical ways of dealing with HIV AIDS in the community. The more we knew about it, then the more we could make some better decisions about what we might want to do to participate in that. This, this goes to the spokes council thing, right? During uh, the one Republican convention in Philadelphia, uh, it was like we shutting it down. And this was at the point where APOC is growing. And so a contingent of us come from New York, meeting up with other contingents of folks of color. And they got a spokes council set up. And I thought it was a really great, I had not heard of, but I think it was, it comes from indigenous practices. But we made our place into the spokes council. And the good thing about it was that our voice, because of the setup of it and the concept of it, our voice was heard. And we had always had criticisms around, you know, mainly white anarchist spaces, like we could get silenced. This one, our voices was heard and we was able to impact, you know, some of the, uh, the shutdown strategies. That let me know that there are different ways that folks can make decisions without hierarchy. You know, that was an experiment, you know, and I think we at that point, always maybe, where somebody somewhere is going to be offering something different. When the Zapatistas did their thing in, in, in two, uh, uh, 1994, never happened like that before. They offered something new and you got to be up on it. You, you want to look at it. You want to study it and what other folks are doing and the, uh, what's the one? connected with um, social ecology or, or municipalism now. Yeah, I want to know so much about it, right? Because there seems to be something new. And new for me, if it's going to be important, how inclusive? Are they dealing with certain issues that we tend to have problems with? Can it offer us any lessons? I want to see it, you know? So things like that, be, it does become important to me. Um, thank you so much.
for offering your wisdom and your humility, Brother Shanti. Like, I don't know. It's it's been really powerful. Um, I wanted to ask about um, your work in the Jericho Movement Organization and uh, future work with political prisoners. Um, I have a certain amount of legal risk. Um, and uh, yeah, it's something that's limited my ability to organize in the ways that I want to. And it's not like I'm, it's not like I can't fight. I know how to fight. It's not like I'm not willing to be hurt. It's not like I'm even, I'm even willing, I wouldn't want to, but I'm even willing to go to prison. What I'm not willing to do is to go through all that alone. What I'm not willing to do is go through all that and on the other side, find nothing. And yeah, okay. I, I guess I want to know what sort of, what sort of care infrastructure has the Jericho movement used to be able to support political prisoners up until now, and what sort of, um, what sort of care infrastructure would allow us to better take care of political prisoners in the future? Because I don't know if I took that sort of risk, I better have housing on the other side. If I take that sort of risk, someone better be feeding me on the other side. And I can't just rely on the friends I've made in the movement to do that because they'll be my friends, whether we're in the movement or not. I need the movement to be giving that to me. So, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, one more question. Okay. That'd be cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Grace. I... Um, yeah, also I'm very interested in that question and mine is maybe a more simplistic version of that. So um, so that you can see me, um, my one of my contributions to revolution, whatever, right, is as a psychotherapist. Um, and so I think about these things a lot, right? Like what happens when we're all together with all of our shit and we don't know where to put it, right? And we're just putting it on each other. And I've seen that happen so many times. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, in this particular work, I, I think of um, how important that healing, how important it is that healing doesn't happen in isolation because there's so many ways that we're atomized and um, put into, well, you gotta go to therapy, right? And you gotta shut your shit out. Um, and, yeah, and what I've realized is that healing happens in relationship, right? Healing happens in people. That, that internal work, right? That individual work is so necessary. Um, and it has to happen alongside the, the collective, right? Alongside like you and me and you and me, right? Um, so I guess I'm always thinking about this and I would love to hear what, from each of your perspectives or whoever wants to answer, how how you see that, maybe that's also a kind of dialectic, right? Um, thank you. Who is talking there? Jericho, okay, oh my God. Jericho, Jericho, National Jericho Movement um, was started by um, um, political prisoners and um, actually all, either political prisoners or former political prisoners, Safia Bukhari, um, Herm, um, Herman Ferguson and Jaleel Monta, Montekin. Jaleel, who just got out uh, a couple of years ago after 49 years. Um, Herman Ferguson was, a, was one of the early uh, black nationalists, black power leaders, had a close relationship with Malcolm X, um, had to go into exile, came back, did some prison time and stuff like that, uh, but still continued to be active. Um, Safia, Panthers, BLA, um, prison, back political prisoners. I'm telling you now, we did not get letters from folks saying, we got your back. We support you. There was none of that stuff for us. We was just in there 
doing what we did, which mostly was trying to get out. But I'm telling you, it's it's been decades. Part of my depression, part of my sadness, part of my grief is that 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50, because you're talking about Rochelle McGee that's still in there, that's been in there for maybe 60 years now, right? No support. No support. Uh, but, but we knew that. We had already set in our minds. We we read, uh, um, um, as they say it's from Bakunin, but um, um, God damn it, what's that pamphlet? Anyway, if it was written by Bakunin, he said that um, a revolutionary is a doomed man. You need to accept now, and if you're getting in this struggle, you're a dead man. But for me, and maybe others, there was something about that that said if you can accept that and you're okay with it, you have actually freed yourself to do the things you need to do in the underground. If you ain't going to worry about the bullet that may come from somewhere or being captured and thrown in the dungeon, you can do what you got to do. So in a sense, it became liberatory. That might have been part of what Huey meant in, in revolutionary suicide. You know, but um, Jericho has not had a lot of successes because it's been hard to get movement people to even take up the issue of political prisoners. You want to feel like if you're in there, that movement got your back. You want to feel that if you come out, it ain't no guarantee that you're going to be taken care of. There should be no reason why, why uh, uh, Lorenzo uh, or, or um, what's his name in Ghana, uh, my comrade, um, Daruba Ben Wahad should not have any, why they got issues with living, places to stay, the means to travel, you know, and it, and so it's really hard, but it's, that is the challenge of our movement. That is a real challenge for me, that you, you take them steps, you want to feel that. The, the, the young person in, in, in Atlanta with the cop city thing, you got to understand that could be anybody. You don't know. Think about it. Feel that. And if you, maybe it's a growing ex acceptance. For some, it may not ever come, but it should help you determine about what you want to do and what risks you're willing to take. You know, so um, I ask, I always ask people to support the political prisoners, whether it's the National Jericho Movement or anarchist Black Cross uh, 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 formations. Come on, y'all. It's a real, real necessity. And it says a lot about us when we don't do that. And then there's uh, rises of struggles on the street, Black Lives Matter and everything, and people are quoting Asada's words. They done turned them into chants. But they ain't doing nothing for Asada as exile. They ain't doing nothing for Sunniata before he got out, almost 50 years. Or uh, um, um, there's a comrade that's locked up in Georgia, uh, that Kamal Siddiqui, and, and these are folks who I know, right? Okay. I feel like a, a, a Chiapas moment. It hurts when I think about my comrades, it hurts. But I still got faith in you. They still got faith in you. When we do communicate with them, we let them know, no, folks are out there doing stuff. You know, they're still fighting back. Even though I'm gonna tell you, man, I wanna see more folks taking on this issue. We burying folks these days. I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be 70 in February. I'm still a baby <laughs> amongst the group. <laughs> but, but no, man, that, yo, this is real. It's real. We need that kind of support from the different movements, organizations, things so that people know. 
some that, uh, real brief, what would the Puerto Rican independence movement, when their political prisoners come out, they can be like ticker tape parades. With us, we just getting buried with our few comrades there. You know, it hurts. It hurts because, you know, it's like we put it in. We was expecting to win, but we didn't. And 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 think about us too, and I'm and I'm gonna shut up. Like one of my comrades, we just had a memorial for Thomas Blood McQuarrie. Thomas would always tell a group, we apologize to you that we didn't win because we didn't want you to go through this. That's his, that's him speaking for us. We didn't win, but y'all got to carry this on. Take up the issue of political prisoners. I'm, I'm not sure what the other question was. And just to add quick, quickly to that, this, I just want to just reinforce a point that you made and say um, a couple points that you made. There's also a lot of people who are younger um, radicals. Uh, I know particularly like a few black anarchists, anarchic radicals who are in prison and nobody knows their names. Like around my age, maybe a little older, just a little bit older. And I've developed one of the closest relationships I have right now with somebody who's incarcerated, who um, I've been very inspired by. And we speak, we have a standing call weekly. And um, when me and this person talk, I've gained a deep insight into the experiences of somebody being incarcerated and how isolating it is and the frustration of feeling forgotten, of feeling like you've been disappeared um, by the prison. And it is of the utmost importance that we wage war against the prison system in this country because what it is doing is it is actually encapsulating all of the worst abuses and the worst uh, the worst um, fa facets of fascism and inflicting it on people daily in a way that is almost hard for many to comprehend. And everything that we are worried about that's happening outside of the prison is already happening inside of the prison. That's where it's, that's where oftentimes it starts before it gets outside. And I really appreciate Martin Sostre for explaining that the prison, the actual building is the maximum security facility. But he said that society was minimum, a minimum security prison. And so I think it's of the utmost importance that we actually are serious about supporting political prisoners and actually modeling um, what it means to show up for people so that we know that what we're doing is actually uh, worth it because we have people that are going to have our backs. And I also just want to reinforce the point that you made about these these elders who are former political prisoners or who have been in the movement for a long time and are living in utter poverty. And it, that, that's one of the things that frustrates me, particularly about the nonprofit industrial complex and about all of these millions of dollars that are missing because you have these celebrity activists who are in, who are nothing but influencers who are just chalking out. They're really politicians who haven't been elected yet. And they are taking up so much space doing this, that, and the third, becoming these faces of movement. And they don't actually organize anything. They don't act, they're not actually in struggle. They're just celebrities that are, uh, become these faces of movement in this, in these nonprofits and in these other spaces. And these people sit up stacking up hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. 
and you have actual revolutionaries, people that risk life and limb, went to prison and are suffering in poverty. What does that say about the movement that we would let that sort of contradiction stand where we have some know nothing celebrity or influencer who's just going around spewing out campaigns and slogans and just becoming a famous, you know, whatever activist. And you have people who are actually committed to revolution who are suffering. We have to actually model the world that we're trying to create. And that starts by actually compensating and taking care of our folks. People need to be paid for the work that they do, have done. People need to be compensated for the effort that they put in. They need to be treated with respect. They need to be comfortable. They need to be taken care of in a way that actually models the world that we want to live in. And it shouldn't be a question of if these elders from the movement are going to be comfortable and compensated in any ways that they need to sustain themselves and to have what they want and what they desire after all of the things that they risk just for us to get to this point. That should not ever be a question. And so I think that like movement and struggling gonna go anywhere if we're not modeling that within these spaces that we're treating folks who have put it all on the line with the utmost respect and taking care of our own people, then what are we working towards if we're not actually modeling that, if that's not praxis? And so with the other question that came up in terms of, you know, uh, us actually coming into these spaces and having a lot of these traumas and um, interacting and putting it all onto one another, I think that that's part of it is that if we're doing a lot of that internal work and we're actually trying to do something transformative, that much of it is going to rely on us being being courageous enough to try to create a model of what we're trying to build in these spaces, not just in um, how we talk, but how we treat one another, how we care for one another, how we show up for one another, how we uh, compensate each other and put in the mutual <laughs> and mutual aid. So it's not just charity. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that word mutual means something. And uh, actually having a truly radical praxis about our interactions that doesn't make it where people look at a space like this and they say, all oh, those people are just all frustrated and uncomfortable and broken fighting with one another. I'm going to go over here with these capitalists because they're going to give me a check and I can go get a nice this and nice that for myself and be comfortable. I'm not going to go suffer with all the people frustrated and, and pissed off. So what can we do in these spaces with the resources that we have or that we um, would hope to expropriate or that we would hope to uh, push and in, push into these funnel into these spaces. What can we do to actually create an environment so that there is an alternative to what people would turn to outside of these spaces? And what I mean by that is the reason so many people when the George Floyd rebellions were happening turned away and it died down and people just went back to voting because that sucked the air out of so much of that uprising. The reason so many times people turn away from these spaces and from uprising and rebellion and go back to business as usual in the capitalist society is because the challenge, I believe, to us is to create an alternative where folks feel like they have a reason to be in these spaces because their needs are going to be met. And if you are coming into this, this, this space and all you're getting is a bunch of trauma and rhetoric, what reason do you have to stay in this movement? Nobody wants to just come here to have new trauma and a bunch of old dead politics and dogma spewed at them 
and then just go home and be poor and in pain. So if we cannot actually create a model here to create something sustainable so people have comfort and people have a reality that is actually an alternative that challenges, because that's the beauty of what I think gets glossed over when people are romanticizing the Black Panther Party is intercommunalism and the survival program was actually posing a programmatic way to create a, a system to meet people's needs and alternative so that people had a reason to stop participating in the society as, as it was as the norm. Something to actually get away from to say, I'm going to go over here with these folks because they have a program in place to meet need. What are we doing to meet people's needs, to pull them out of electoralism, to pull them out of capitalism, to pull them out of all of these things that are pressing down on us and, and, and uh, killing us day to day? It has to be, it can't just be a bunch of talk, a bunch of rhetoric and a bunch of um, pain that nobody, nobody wants that. And that's why a lot of people leave movement. That's why I could have fallen out of movement myself, because when I was having the experiences that led me to start reading about anarchism, I could have just said, man, y'all are tripping. I'm done. Like, I'm out of here. This is too much. Like, because it was it's traumatic. You could just say, like, I don't want to deal with this, this shit. Y'all sitting around here arguing about uh, stuff people wrote 150 years ago. And then, you know, y'all broken. We all tired. I don't want to be doing this. Like, who was that? I mean, really, like, who, who, like you, there has to be something that actually challenges this society that we live in for people to say, this is an alternative that feels like something that makes me, I want to be a part of that. And that's what's so important about these questions is that has to begin with a lot of internal work and us actually trying to create and facilitate things to really take care of each other in big ways in big ways that actually threaten capitalist society.